Um, okay, so um, I think we're going to have a chance to thank people, but let me just make sure that we, we, we thank uh, two people, Andrew Simeon and, and James Anderson there, who, who are broadcasting this video out to, um, to uh, in live. And it's also, if you, if you went to sleep tonight, you can watch it later. Uh, go to our website. Uh, Paul, our moderator, and uh, Barbara, Barbara Hoverstein. Where is she? I don't. Uh, she put this whole thing together and brought all of us together. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Jeff Marcy. Okay, well, I'd like to, um, uh, first of all, echo what Dan just said and, and thank the, the people that organized this whole event. It's really, uh, this is unprecedented. I don't think we've ever seen anything like this, uh, at least I haven't, anywhere. So it's, it's really wonderful that the people that worked so hard to put this event together have done so. Uh, I want to thank them again. Um, Dan, you're wrong. Uh, uh, and I want to emphasize some preconceived notions that we all grew up with that we're just going to have to reconsider. And one of them comes from the evolutionary biologists. This diagram that we all saw uh, when we were children of chimpanzees uh, evolving into orangutans and then eventually Australopithecine and then finally Homo erectus, uh, th that's a nice story for the primates and it gives us the notion that all species simply evolve brainier and, bra and brainier versions of themselves. But it's just simply not the case. And you look at the uh, biological record on Earth, the paleontological record, for three billion years, life just didn't get brainier. Uh, something happened on the East African savanna about four billion years ago, RD and Lucy being our most popular representatives, something happened two to four million years ago, sorry, on the East African savanna, and no one knows what. Some confluence of um, environmental factors, the deteriorating tropical rainforest, uh, the, the desert coming in, uh, and, and the cheetahs uh, and the, the wildebeest somehow doing something else that gave hominids a leg up. Um, but it's clearly a rarity because for four billion years that didn't happen, and it didn't happen with any other species. So we really have to get out of the mindset, I think, from what the evolutionary biologists are telling us, that species get smarter and that we humans are at the pinnacle of the evolutionary tree and we think we're number one. Brains are just one way to compete. The cheetahs think that speed is the way to compete. The cockroaches think that a hard shell is the way to compete. Uh, the giraffes are convinced that the long neck is the only way to go. And, and so to, for us to be arrogant and think that our brains are going to be the, the byproduct of evolution on a normal, uh, habitable world is, is not borne out by the, by the uh, paleontological evidence. Um, I want to say a word about the rare earth hypothesis. I, I agree with Dan in large part. Uh, we don't know whether... Uh, planets that are stably habitable for four billion years are common or rare. But what I do know is that there are enough factors that make our Earth precious, just the right amount of water. The moon has to be large. It's a rare moon that we have that stabilizes the spin axis of the Earth, without which the Earth's spin axis would wobble around and the Earth would have its pole point right toward the sun and the hemisphere toward the sun would be blowtorched, the other side frigid and frozen. The moon is a rare moon. We, you look in our solar system, there aren't any other moons like our moon, a single moon that stabilizes the spin axis. And all these other factors about Jupiter and water and the chemical composition on the Earth, uh, maybe the Earth is a rarity. And I agree, we don't know, but it's possible. So the door is wide open for the uh, for planets like the Earth in the, in, with habitability for such a long time, four billion years, to let Darwinian evolution do its thing, that kind of a planet could be one in a million. We just don't know. And then the final thing I'd like to say in rebutting Dan is um, 
I, I, I'm becoming f more, how shall I put it, well, emotionally honest, I'm frustrated at the SETI community working for 40 years, which is heroic, but every time there's a non-detection, uh, they say, oh, dismiss the non-detections. We've searched uh, a million channels, a billion channels. We've searched out to 100 light years. Uh, yeah, I agree with Dan that there are only a few frequencies that have been sampled, but here on the Earth, we humans are broadcasting at the full spectrum of frequencies. So why wouldn't the advanced civilizations be doing the same? The children of the advanced species on Alpha Centauri, the, the kids would have little radio transmitters that are petawatts, and they'd be able to send signals to the stars uh, without any trouble, just the way kids here on Earth uh, control uh, little race cars or sailboats uh, on the lake. So I, I'm becoming frustrated that SETI has gone for 40 years, that's a lot of time, and to suggest that the next 40 years are going to be much different from the last 40 years or the next 400 years be different, it's not clear. At some point, the non-detections by various means of advanced technological species, those non-detections should not just be dismissed. If you look and you don't see, the model of our galaxy has to be altered, and you have to say to yourself, ah, our galaxy doesn't have advanced species that transmit at these specific frequencies. Doesn't that tell you something about the uh, paucity of those advanced civilizations? So I think I'll stop my rebut there. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dan and uh, Jeff. Those are great arguments. I'm just curious. Let's just do a hand poll. Raise your hands. <laughs> there are three choices. Who believes Dan? Who believes Jeff? And who can't decide? So first question, who believes Jeff Marcy's arguments the most? Interesting. About a third, maybe? Who is for Dan Wertheimer and SETI. Oh. <laughs> well, that's your family over there. In the <laughs> and who just can't decide? On there you go. Yeah. Need more evidence. Would like to hear more. Yeah. It's very interesting. OK, so now we'll go into uh, question time. Uh, who would like to ask the first question? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, uh, could, um, could, you, were, could you repeat the question, please? The question is, is, are, is E.T. going to eat us? And um, Steve, uh, Steve Hawking had a show on the Discovery Channel, I think it was, last week, for some of you who might have caught it. And he, one thing that uh, is in my favor is that Steve Hawking said aliens are out there. And he's smarter than Jeff and me, so I think uh, that's sort of Combined. conclusive proof that, that I'm right. Uh, but. The other thing that Stephen Hawking says, we should be careful because they might be dangerous. They, they, might, uh, uh, they might come and take our resources. Or, and, and advanced civilizations, uh, are, it's not good when advanced civilizations come in contact with primitive civilizations. Um, and so uh, we could be in a lot of trouble. And he was advocating that Earthlings not transmit stuff out. Uh, I don't think he was saying we shouldn't go look do passive searches, which is what we're doing. But some people advocate that we should transmit messages hoping to make contact with ET. And I actually agree that that's a kind of a dangerous thing. Everything you do in science is t potentially dangerous. Anything you do, just driving your car is dangerous, and you have to you know, measure the risk. But transmitting, I think, this may not be a good idea, because we're just an emerging, so we don't know what's out there. And it's possible that, well, I mean, a lot of people think that advanced civilizations are uh, they will you know, be peaceful because they, in order to live for a billion years, they've got to figure out how to stop killing each other. But that's just a, that's what we think, but we're not sure. So there are risks involved. And I think, so we sh my thinking is that we should not be blasting stuff out into space. We should be doing these passive searches. And let's listen. And in a 1,000 years, if we don't hear anything, then we should think about transmitting. <laughs> I'll just add one little note, which is I think Stephen Hawking is missing one very simple fact, which is, <laughs> 